What is up, fam? You know what time it is. Welcome back to the Friday segment of the Best Damn Agency Podcast. This is Sales on the Rocks. As always, I will captain this here podcast. I'm your host, JJ Russell. Do all the things that make me feel warm and fuzzy. Rate, review, subscribe. Click the bell to get the notifications uh, because you want to hear from this guy, my guest, my friend, my partner in crime, the one and only Joey Gilkey. What is up, brother? Hey, man. What an intro. You're getting real smooth at it. Howdy. You're getting real smooth. Well, the more bourbon I drink before we do the intro, the better it sounds. (laughs) Yeah, I I poured a little tall one today. I wasn't sure if I was going to drink, but uh, four o'clock rolls around and here we are drinking yet again. Yeah, it's five o'clock in the UK. Actually, it's like eight o'clock. It's like uh, eight or nine. Anywho. So, yeah. We're we're all good, uh, and I'm sure we have listeners in the UK. Uh, so we're we're doing this for them. Really, we are drinking because we want you to feel at home. That's right. Uh, what do you? What are you drinking? What's in your glass? Well, you told me to drink it because it was on my shelf, and I listed off. I don't know what I want to drink today, so I listed off all my drinks. And the first one I said, you said no other ones need to be stated. So uh, this is the Elmer T. Lee Single Barrel Mash. Mm, because it is absolutely delicious. It is. It's very smooth. Somewhat it is, silky. For real, it's one of my favorite of all time. So I was in a, I had a blind test, a taste test with, mm-hmm. let's see, there was a, there was a Weller Antique. There okay. was a Pappy, the um, Family Reserve Rye, which is, I think, either a 12 or a 15 year. Yep. And I want to say there was a, a Peerless um the first year that their rye came out so that was like it stood out because it was so so different but then there was the elmer t lee and between all of those the elmer t was are you a rye guy or are you are you a bourbon guy i prefer bourbon um i like it weeded i like it sweet but i like rye. i mean i wonder if you did a lineup with elmer t eh taylor trying to think of some other comparable ones it's so hard because eh taylor is my favorite and elmer t's yours but I, I like rye, but there's not. I'm not. I like Willet rye. If I'm going to go with a rye, I like Willet. It's delicious, and it's not. It won't break the bank. I think Willet rye is right. what like sixty 50, or seventy bucks. Fifty two bucks. Fifty five. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, so let's do that. What's though, maybe not. Maybe more. <laughs> yeah, gas prices and liquor prices. It's That's basically right. the same thing. Um, what is so? I've had a couple of good bourbons on the shelf recently. Ones that I've been excited about. I've had some friends bring over some good bourbons. So. Um, outside of your personal collection, is mm-hmm. there anything that you've tried in the last, let's call it last month or two that you were like, damn, this is really good. I've got to get a bottle if I can. Um, man, that's a good one. I haven't really been drinking much lately, so it's hard. I haven't had anything lately. Um, just on this I'll, show. Do it just on the show. Pretty much. Uh, actually, I, I had a, a really good on Yeho the other day. I'm not, it's not bourbon, obviously, but it's an Yeho tequila that I really like. Um, I don't remember the name at this particular moment. Um, I forgot. Something familiar. Well, that's really helpful. Thanks, Something Joey. Familiar. <laughs> you put me on the spot. You, if it's a sales question, I can answer it. If it's booze, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, if you needed a reminder, Joey gets zero prompting for any of these questions, and you heard it yep. right there. The first that's time right. I've ever stumped him in 35 episodes. I did have some good question. wine, though. Um, okay. The Grotch family cab. Uh, 2012 it was really okay. good. It was 80 bucks and it was really good. Tasty. Nice. If you're a wine drinker, there you go. Yep. I, um, I, I set myself up for this too, which was awesome. Oh, <laughs> I think this is maybe the third time that that has been a sentence on this show, <laughs> which is shameful. It should be more. Uh, well, Hey, congratulations. Thank um, you. I, I, I got you my quota for the year. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like two <laughs> yep oh man well i think we teased in the last episode that that chris dreyer would be joining us which man i was personally fired up for but we'll, I have, was to keep, too. we'll have to keep people uh, on the hook he's going to be with us in the next <laughs> week or so he's certainly top he, three mentioned names on the show if not number one and like top three of my favorite humans yeah he's pretty so. awesome i can't wait till the retreat and captain chris comes out I won't mention Captain but he, Chris. He is sick, which is why he's not here. No, so he'll be here in the near future. Is sick. Which is worse. 
Yeah. Um, I'd rather be sick and sleeping all day than have my wife and kids sleep and be sick all day and have to take care of them. And can't get to work, can't do anything. Yep. Your whole schedule. It's, it's hard. COVID is hard. It's being sick is hard. So back to the best bourbon you've had recently or best liquor you've had recently. I had, I tried a, a bourbon I've never had. Okay. Which, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not some like high Savant. rolling liquor aficionado or bourbon aficionado, but I've had a lot of bourbons. Um, and my buddy brought over a Weller Foolproof Store Select. So for those who are not mm. uh, acquainted with the Store Select version of a single barrel, basically these store owners go to the distillery, try a couple of different bottle or uh, barrels, do some tastings, and pick the actual barrel that they want. And then there yeah. are only you know so many bottles that come from that. Love so, it. man, I've, I'd had Weller Antique. I'd had uh, obviously Special Reserve, which is the easiest one to find. Foolproof. Mm-hmm was one that i had not had that's the blue label and it was bad ass was like it? is that good huh? yeah when we lined up we had like five or six bottles on the table and the other ones were all you know 50 60 70 dollar bottles and the foolproof was just distinctly more chocolate brown than the other ones like you could tell that it had not been cut in any way really um it, and it was hot it was good. I mean, you know that liquor is good when you drink it at like 120 proof and it's mm-hmm. delish, delicious. Yeah. Um, uh, who's the Old Scout is like that? Old Scout has like 123 proof. A barrel strength, yeah. yeah it's so good. Um, company Distilling was the one I, I probably would have given an answer to your question on. Okay, nice. Was, uh, I don't own Company Distilling. I got it and I gave it to you. But um, it was one of my favorites re- too. It's, it's my most recent under $50 bottle. That I tried, and I was like, "Ooh, damn, that's interesting." The store behind it is super cool. It's the it's the Jack Daniels head distiller left and um, created his own like experimental distilling company called Company. Pretty dope. Anybody that tries it at my house freaking loves it. And at first, they're like, "Ooh, maple." That just sounds kind of weird. And then they because mm-hmm. it's finished in a a, a maple, maple wood yep. cask. Yep. And it tastes like the most delicious weeded bourbon mixed with maple syrup. It's, it's amazing. Candy man. Candy. It is candy. All right, so let's we'll transition here. I, I teased this last week, or we did this last week. We're going to continue to do it for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to hit like three minutes on objection right. handling. So okay. I want to get your best take on this exact objection. So Sweet. one that I feel like I get a lot, the surface level response or objection is, um, yeah, it just doesn't fit our timeline. Mm-hmm. Like we've we've got other projects in the works. We're going to have to push this out, you know, three, six, nine months, Q2, Q3, Q4, whatever. Yep. Do you just let that ride or do you like really dig into that when you get that? Sometimes I let it ride. It really comes down to the context of the other questions I've asked in the conversation. Um, Okay. You know, by the nature of what sales driven agency does, like no one's heard of the service that we do. They've heard of lead gen shops. They've heard of sales training companies. They've heard of sales recruiting companies. They've heard of uh operations consultants but nobody does what we do which is all of that right where we come in and we hire and we train we'll process we'll tech we do all these things and so i get it when someone's like hey i didn't like have a line item budget here like yes i want to hire some salespeople this year but sure building a sales operation having this done for us was just wasn't there so like there's an aspect of sympathy or empathy there um However, I will push back on for them. It's just understanding like, okay, like what's going to change between now and Q3? Is it simply a budget thing, right? Is it simply just I need to get my money in order? Um, Or is it, well, we've got some other initiatives. And so I want to ask what are those initiatives? And so it's like, okay, cool. So you guys want to work on this and this and this? Great. That makes sense. But why why in that order, right? Because previously you made your decision on what you're going to do this year before you had the information that we just went over on this call because you didn't know we existed. Fair enough. Now that you know what you what we have on the call and you know that we have a direct impact on revenue, revenue reinvested in the company can accelerate those other things and get there a lot sooner. So you can have your sales team and all those same things that you want to invest in this year, probably on the same timeline, but be in a lot more comfortable place, right? So there's that aspect of, of identifying, well, I need to hire an account manager. Oh, I need to work on finance or whatever it might be right i'll typically just have to probe and ask questions on like well you know i know that this wasn't something that was necessarily on your radar but now that it is and you know that it has a direct 
impact on revenue, would it not make sense to try to solve this first? Because it's going to have a drastic impact on how much money you can invest in those other things to accelerate how fast you can get those done and done well. Yeah. Yeah. Or like my, my, my least favorite, it's like, oh, you know, I really want to focus on our service and, you know, make sure that we have scalability and we can deliver, you know, the amount of clients that come on. It's like, you're thinking about this opposite is you're going to have a system that can handle a lot more clients and no way of sending more clients into your system. All right. Now, I know you're watching that video. I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm going to because I would be remiss if I did not tell you about Sales Driven Agency, my company. I'm the CEO of Sales Driven Agency. We work specifically with digital marketing agencies to build out the sales operation. What is the sales operation, do you ask? Well, in order for you to become a predictable, sustainable, scalable agency, it has to come from having a well-oiled sales operation, which is sales processes, sales systems and frameworks. How do we get repeatable outcomes? Sales people. How do you go find the sales people? How do you hire them? How do you train them? How do you manage them when they do start? How do you set them up for success? What does enabling the sales team look like? How do you build out the tech stack? What's the CRM and sales engagement and proposals, meeting structure, scripts, templates? What do those things look like? Well, you don't have to figure those things out because you likely will never be able to. That's why we exist. Sales Driven Agency, we architect your sales processes. We build out your tech stack. We hire and train your salespeople for you. We will recruit them. We will hunt them. We will even build the compensation plan for you. We will build the training to make sure they're successful. We will train you on how to manage them once we're gone. And on top of that, we will guarantee our success. A 5x minimum return on your investment in the six months we work together. And you will have an entire sales operation built for you. We build the car. We teach you to drive it. We hand you the keys and walk away. If you're interested in having your digital agency have the sales operation built for you so you can scale and grow, become predictable, sustainable, and scalable, go to www dot sales driven agency dot com. You can also click the link below. Again, sales driven agency dot com. Go book a call or click the link below and book a call. Then my name is Joey Gilkey. I'm going to send you back to the video. Hope you enjoy. Hope you'll also check us out at sales driven agency dot com. So Which for a lot of performance marketing agencies, it's the same conversation, right? Like mm -hmm. investing in marketing turns ROI, which is money in, which creates opportunity to right. do all of the things. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Especially if you're positioned in a way where you're painting the picture of your service and the value that you create, which you should be doing, um, as opposed to just like the features and the services and all the things. Um, For sure. That's the value-based pricing piece we've talked about before on the show, but that's, that's good. I actually really like People walk in with a timeline, but their timeline does not include all of the information that you've just given them. So they need right. to step back and rethink and not just live with the old information, which is now outdated. I think that's... Well, because a lot of it's like, okay, we want to do ops and fulfillment. We want to hire account managers. And yeah, I want to hire salespeople, but I'm just not confident that we can make it work. And so I don't want to put money in a salesperson, not knowing if it's going to work and then blow the money I could spend on account management and ops and all these kind of things. Well your equation has sales not potentially not working my equation that's not an option yeah right sales is going to work you just got to invest in it and when it works it's going to spin off a lot of cash and that cash can be invested in the other things you're talking about and so you're going to have all of it instead of potentially some of it you know and so i think that's a way to kind of spin it a little bit is just making sure that they know the way that you're thinking about things either you weren't thinking about it at all or you were but you had a level of risk in your mind that you had to think through and the juice just wasn't worth the squeeze yet until you invested in some of the other things that you want to figure out. Yeah, that's good. And it comes back to qu to asking the right question and continuing to dig in and understand and then kind of challenging or pressing the issue. That's great. All right, let's talk about knowledge bases Ooh, for sexy. sales specifically. So <laughs> I, I am I'm doing some consulting with sales driven agency or some different pieces of what we deliver for sales driven agency. So part of what I get to do is I get to dive into these like deep dive interviews with uh, founder CEOs right now to to understand their current situation so that we can build a roadmap for them. So a lot this question is actually coming from one of these interviews where I was like, "Do you have a knowledge base?" And they were like, "A what?" And I'm like, <laughs> "A hub where you keep all of your assets and templates and scripts and all the things." 
to enable your salespeople to yep. be successful, a one-stop shop for those things. And they were like, we no. still don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so yeah. um, in addition to maybe giving a little bit more of a definition than what I just did, I want to know like specifically, if you could yep. think categorically through the top tier of things that need to be in there, like what line items of, of things do you need yep. to have access to in a knowledge base? From a sales perspective? Yeah, sales yeah, perspective. Yeah, so... Um, as a, what is a knowledge base? I mean, it's a, it's a database of, of the brain of your, let's just stay in the sales vein, your sales operation. So it is, it is your knowledge, um, distilled into checklists, standard operating procedures, scripts, templates, whatever, right? It's your processes documented and stored in a database, right? In a, in a um, very streamlined, accessible, searchable format so that yep. when people have questions on how to do things or need inspiration for something or need to be trained, et cetera, they go to this one centralized hub and they can either follow a protocol to go through certain pieces of content or if they know they're trying to recall something, they can search for it and, and an element of it will show up in a search and therefore you can get the answer pretty quickly. Um, the benefits of that are one, repeatability. Two, it eliminates back and forth of someone, uh, a process you have documented or a way of doing things documented um, that can be distilled into like a page in your knowledge base. Instead of a person going to you and saying, hey, how do I do this? It's go to the knowledge base first, try to find it. If you can't find it, then come to me. So it eliminates a lot of that management employee back and forth. So that's one thing. Um, some of the things need to be in there. I mean, I think you can break it down into a couple of categories, but I think as a whole, you want to have one year process documentation. So how do we get repeatable outcomes um, for everything from left of deal, which we consider everything before a first time appointment. So how do we build lists? How do we do campaigns? How do we assemble campaigns? How do we use the tools that enable us to go after the people we want to go after? What's our, um, what's the ideal customer profile look like? Like that's left of deal right of deal training would be what happens from first time appointment through the close. So how do we run a prospect through our sales process? What does first time appointments look like? Um, what are the email scripts that we send before emails for meeting confirmation or before meetings for e or, uh, meeting confirmations? What do the notes look like we take on the calls? What does the meeting recap email look like? What do the notes in the second calls? What do proposals look like? All those things are right of deal. Um, Sales management is a category. So how do you manage your sales reps? What do your dashboards look like? What, how do we set up dashboards? How do we read dashboards? How do we document our meetings? How do we uh, script out and plan our review time so that we can have actually good meetings? Um, how do we use our tech? How do we train our sales reps? How do we onboard our sales reps? Um, all those things are, are content for a knowledge base. Um, okay. So there's just some categories. Uh, that was a lot. Let, let me ask a follow up to that. That's great. We at a leadership level, and I think a lot of companies probably have this embedded in their culture. Like I would hope, um, have left freedom and, and sort of like a decentralized autonomy for people to add to the knowledge base as they see fit. Right. So if I am in a prospect or client facing role. Like I'm going to have more interaction with prospects and clients than you as the CEO yep. are on a day-to-day -day basis. And so when it comes to um, like adding to scripts or adding to follow-up cadences or adding assets or adding email templates, all those things, like yep. I should be adding to what we currently have. Yes. But my question is, how do you, how do you give access to or gate that responsibility? Like, do you give that responsibility to a new hire? When do you give somebody the ability to add information or edit information? Yeah, I think if they're an integral part of the operation, whether they're like a senior salesperson or an SDR manager or um, or something like that, like I think that they should have access to it. Now, I think the rule is don't delete anything. If you're going to add something to a page, add it to the bottom. And I think it's okay. the job of the salesperson and the sales leader to kind of filter that and and clean it up maybe once a quarter. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's like a, there should be more of a process, which is a good thought on what's our process for cleaning our process database. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't think you don't have to add as much as you think you would. 
right? Like I, I, we do have, so like right now with Matt, who's our senior sales closer, um, we have a running cheat sheet that I built of like, hey, here's metaphors we use. Here's questions we ask. Here's these things. Um, and there's just a line and everything under the line, he can add whatever he wants to to make his own cheat sheet. Cool. And then we'll go over it together. And if it makes sense to pull something up from his area to my area, then great. Well, you know, we pull it up and we we make it more official in the actual document. But um, yeah, I think people should have freedom, but they shouldn't delete stuff. And so there should be some sort of quality assurance that goes through that. The next crucial question is, are you wearing a cardigan? <laughs> Mm-mm. Now, this is, uh, this is actually a hooded button up flannel. It's just a black flannel. It really looks like a cardigan sweater. It's hilarious. Well, I just know it's, it's I, got I, a hood. I could put the hood up like Darth Maul. Uh, I had to know for my personal well being if you were wearing a cardigan. No, I haven't or worn not, a cardigan so. since I was in fucking eighth grade, you dingus. <laughs> uh, um, okay, we've got an interesting scenario in the mastermind. Uh, I don't even know if you know this, uh, but we've got a <laughs> member who's got a goal to add. Hire, onboard, add nine new salespeople in the next year. Yeah, I talked to him today. Okay. That's I'm going to help him do it. Ton of... Okay. Well, that one, that's fantastic yeah. uh, because I was going to offer that up too. But second, like, you know, this guy, you know, his business, you know, his personality, you know, his goals better than, than a lot of people. Um, is it possible? to be too aggressive when it comes to... I mean, like nine new salespeople is a, is a shit ton. Yeah, it is. Um, to, a, to a relatively, like... I mean, not small agency, but we're not talking, like, $100 million agency. Yeah, they're at 13 million. They would be, like, tripling the size of their current sales team, I think. Yes. Uh, can you be too aggressive? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think... The answer is yes, you can be. Do I think he is? Not necessarily. I think he's going into the smart mindset, which is we've got good process. We've got good accountability. He's now got a sales director. Um, and so there's accountability frameworks. There's leadership frameworks. There's coaching frameworks. It's all good. He's got uh, an obvious model that's working. You know, I think he's operating probably at like a 7x on target earnings right now for his sales reps. Okay. Maybe a little bit, Maybe a little bit less. So I would love to see him have a little bit higher on-target earnings multiple of his sales team. So like optimize the people he's already got or the people that he's adding? Yes, because as you naturally, as you uh, increase the amount of bodies in the team, naturally the effectiveness is probably going to drop for a season as a as a collective. Sure. But what's good about him is going into, he's got a really intelligent way of thinking about it, which is I know at the end of the day, I'm not carbon copying my best salesperson when I hire nine people. I'm going to have some people that are outliers and great performers. I'm going to have some people who are average. I'm going to have some people who are underperforming. i got to fire them and replace them. And so as long as he knows that and he has the budget for it, which he does, he's got good margins, um, then I think that that you can do that. The, the challenge that you're going to run into as you scale up an agency sales team is how big is your TAM? And how do you mm-hmm. ensure that... Um, how do you ensure that your your salespeople aren't walking on top of each other? Yeah. Um, and cross pollinating the same prospects kind of thing. And so then the question, the, the juggling act then becomes, well, how do you slice up the market that we target in such a way that is equitable across all 12 reps, right? And so if if our TAM is 50,000 total companies that can buy from us, cool. We can we can slice that up into roughly 4,500, 5,000 contacts per person, and then you go, right? Yeah. If your market's small and you've got 10,000 and you've got 12 reps, well, you're kind of starting to get on top of each other. And so how do you... One, you need to do all your list building up front and slice it up, or you need to do regional, geographic, or vertical specific target yeah because you could have each rep or different reps or groups of reps target they're fairly ag- industry agnostic like in terms of like yeah. they're not they're not completely agnostic to who do you who they say they're not a generalist but they only do seo and they like to stay in the SaaS tech startup um but they also work with some other random industries as well so then you can have reps that are specialized there so i think you're, you're gonna run into some problems there as you scale but 
Uh, the answer is yes and no. Not the really answer your question. Yeah, and it sounds like, and again, we know this person, like he, he's been really thoughtful in the way that he's approaching it. So my question was less about him, using him as an example. And Typical more agency, I'd say no. You'd, you'd say that that's too aggressive? Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's really good. Um, it all comes down to infrastructure, which is always my answer, which is if you have the process and the if you have the platform to be successful, then cool, you can afford <laughs> yeah. to be more aggressive. If it's like we're hiring nine salespeople and we're going to just let them nothing. lose. Because well, yeah. the part is like what's good about what he has and, and part of infrastructure is visibility and accountability and transparency. And if you have a methodology for tracking quantitative and qualitative success, then you can actually make the decision. You know, you have a, you have a lot. Um, you can make decisions faster. You could, you could fire sales reps that aren't performing faster because you have the data across the board across 12 people. But if you're just yep. a dude who just, you know, maybe you got some funding and you're just like, I'm not build a nine person, 12 person team because I got the cash to do it. It's like, well, you're probably going to go like, like two for 12 <laughs> and it's sure. going to go really sure. poorly for you. Yep. Back to the basics process yep. first and then the yep. people. Yep. Exactly. How, so if we switch the conversation to not sales reps, but like uh, referral partners, whether mm-hmm. that be you know, consultants into a specific vertical or other clients that are already working with you who operate in the vertical that you serve. I, it's funny. I, I got into a conversation about like sales rep compensation. And then this person I was talking to was like, well, do you think the exact same way for referral partners? And we we got into that dialogue a little. Like how would you, what would commission structures look like for, for referral. referral partners? How do you think about composing those agreements or deals it's really interesting because i don't like i don't mind giving referrals i i personally don't i'll just be transparent we have one referral partner that pays me and every dollar that comes in i put in a donor advised fund that i give it away (laughs) i don't tell anybody that because it's just what i do but i don't care like i don't care about the money right like i have a business model that makes me money if it comes an extra, yeah, it's straight to the bottom line if I want it to be, but I can just pretend it's not like not there and I can just go send it to the nonprofit I care about. So but let's say we built a bunch of channel partnerships. So let's take this yeah. conversation to like more. Well, of I'm a having this conversation literally actively right now with cool. with a, a really solid potential strategic partner. And and they have historically done a 10% reciprocal agreement where I pay 10%, they pay 10%, it's reciprocated, right? I'm fine to pay them 10%. I don't care about your money, period. Because the way I look at referrals is, for me, I am my client's advocate. And if I have money in the middle, I don't want to make decisions based off the money I could make. I want to make decisions based off of what's going to serve my client the best. And if I feel like you can serve my client the best, I would much rather get deposits in the bank of reciprocity mm. than take 3500 bucks. Like That just doesn't move the needle for me in my life or my business. So... That's how I think about it. Now, let's just go back. Let's, maybe not everybody thinks that way, so that's fine. I like to, I actually would pay a referral partner more than I pay a salesperson, believe it or not. Oh, shit. Okay. Interesting. Um, here's why. And well, by the way, my referral partner is going to send to my salesperson. My salesperson is going to get paid the same, even though it's an easier sale. So everyone wins here. Okay. Why do I do that? Because Because my referral partner has... Built trust, built authority, credibility to the point where this potential client is willing to take a call with our company because of that trust and authority. So they are imparting and instilling the the trust and authority that they have done all the hard work for, not just in the sales side, but on the delivery side, right? So like when they sell a client into their yep. fractional CFO company, the what they're doing is they're building credibility in the sales process for that person to... So they're getting trust points there. And then they mm-hmm. close the deal. And then they're building trust in the delivery. So there's there's, yeah. there's a lot of trust being built there, not just in a sale. And so they're building all this trust through months, maybe years of time. And they're going to just give that to me. And so I'm like, cool. I'll take a hit to my bottom line. Um, to make sure that this is continued to be reciprocated back and forth. If you want the referral, you know, like I'm super weird because like sometimes I tell people like, I don't want referral money and they're like, Oh yeah, sure. We won't take it either. But like most people probably want it. Sure. 
you know? Yeah. I just have, I, I'm, a, I'm a different weird being. So, um, nonetheless, that's how I think about it. I do think that should be paid a decent amount. You know, like I'm just, I'll be transparent with our, our sales person gets paid. Um, our roadmaps are $5,000. They get paid 500 bucks to close. They get 10% on the roadmap. And then the uh, the bigger sale on the back end of the roadmap is our engagement, which ranges from sixty five to a hundred thousand dollars, and they get paid five percent of the full engagement. And so, yep. uh, the reason I'll pay more is because they're not doing proposals or anything. They're literally just they're selling a roadmap, handing it over to the team. The team is doing the work on putting together the plan, and your job is just to sell the plan. And so, any given sale, you can make between four grand and five hundred six grand um, if you sell a roadmap and a, a full engagement so I'm, I'm happy to pay it ends up equally out to between six five point eight percent and seven and a half percent cool um, depending on the deal size I will pay a referral partner ten percent that's cool that's a great still answer, pay right? the salesperson. I, it's a lot of stuff that I hadn't heard and I like that um, yeah so you talked yeah. about this idea of building trust in the sales process that then is kind of passed off to the next person, whether it be the delivery team mm-hmm. or a referral partner. I feel like that segue is really good into another question that I had and it's about churn. Yeah. And so I was digging into an agency recently uh, that we have the potential to work with and <laughs> I know you're talking we, about we looked at yeah, you know, we looked at this pro forma of like all the things that we were going to do for them and how much we were, you know, we were going to hire multiple salespeople and create all these processes and set up outbound and all these things, you know, but the quantity of sales it was going to get, take to get them to their goal yeah. was like astronomical because their churn rate was approaching 10%. Yes. Um, and so per month. Per yeah, which we dug into the numbers a little bit more. I think it's actually closer to like six or seven. Okay. Long but story still. short, it's still high. Um, the question is like, how can you impact churn positively throughout the sales process, if at all? Um, well, I think it's just that it's having an actual defined sales process, right? Where the where the the goal is to actually lead them through the process, right? So some people just kind of like take it as they go. It's reactive and eventually a deal gets done maybe. Um, But having a process where the experience is really good. So it's, you're always getting meeting confirmation emails. We're taking really good notes. We're always remembering our last call. We're having meeting recap emails that give them all the information they talked about. We always schedule the next call while we have them on the current call. Like if, if you have your shit together, then yeah. it, it starts to build trust and they assume that it's going to continue that way in, on the delivery side until you prove them wrong. And so it really comes down to, do you have a process for how you work them through uh, the sales conversation? And so I think that's the biggest thing you can do is, is make sure that's a really smooth process. Um, and I also think that there's, there's a level of like, how do you sell, right? Like I, one reason Matt really enjoys selling for us is one, he believes in the product, which is an obvious thing that should happen. But two, is he realizes this is not a pressure. We're not we're not trying to optimize for conversions by being pressure salespeople. We're always trying to optimize for conversions. Don't get me wrong. Uh, we're always trying to close more than we currently close, but we're not trying to do it through pressure tactics, right? The goal is entirely about how do we actually um, get better at the sales process, provide more value, ask better questions, drag them to the glass so that they can understand the impact it has on their business so that conversions then go up. And so I think yeah. if you can eliminate that, have a very solid process, develop trust through that whole time of being an advocate for them, and then I think that that can continue in delivery, which then now it's your delivery team's time to, to really perform. Yeah. The other one that we talked about on the call too with this particular prospect client um, is targeting, right? Like, Part of it being outbound versus inbound, and we've talked about this before, inbound prospects, they have intent already, but they might or might not be qualified. You might or might not want to work with them versus outbound. You don't necessarily know if they're qualified. You have to do a better job of that throughout the sales process. Um, Sorry, you don't know if they have intent, but you know that they are qualified. You know that they are in a vertical you want to work with. And then I think at that point, it's like, 
do we actually like these people? Do our goals align with theirs? Can we actually meet their need um, mm-hmm. now that we've reached out to them? And so yeah. I think one, targeting the right companies, but yes. then two, doing a really good job of vetting and qualifying uh, throughout the sales process. I mean, you just had a conversation with Matt where he told a prospect no, who wanted yep. to work with us, yep. but he knew that it wasn't going to be a good fit and therefore they would have churned and that would have hurt your churn rate versus he told him no. And so that, that helps, right? And that's the, has the opposite effect. Yep. Well, what's uh, even better is like they wouldn't have been able to churn because we don't, you know, we don't have a retainer based model. That's actually a good point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but which is even better, right? Because it's not even about churn. It's about I want to serve my colleagues who, yes, though I pay their bills through selling and creating revenue that pays the bills. I'm also somewhat of a the first level guard or filter to your well being. By if you have shitty clients, you're going to not enjoy working with that client, which is going to impact your work with other clients, which is going to impact our effectiveness, which is going to impact my ability to sell what we do. So I think it's a big happy circle of life. But yeah, he's taking care of the delivery team, which is honorable and respectful, and he's still going to get paid for it because that's how we build our organization. Is if you're able to walk away from a deal that you could close and you're doing it in the name of they wouldn't be a good client and they wouldn't serve, then not. you shouldn't be punished for that. You should be rewarded. Yeah, that's great. Really cool that he gets that a month into working with us. Like he is yeah, such a good I didn't tell him. Like I didn't tell him I was going to pay him. Like now he knows <laughs> for the future, but he just did it out of like the training of who, here's who we work with. And he called me. He's like, hey, like I'm thinking about walking away, but I don't want to send any of the revenue. I was like, no, dude, like if it's in your gut, they're going to be a bad customer. Like walk away from it. Feel good about that. Um. And so I never told him I was going to pay him still, but he's, he's like, yeah, they're done. It's like, great. So it worked out. Matt, you're a good human being and I'm glad you're <laughs> on our team. He is. He's awesome. I ran into a company recently that, that will probably end up working with us. They've got three to four founders um, that are engaged Fun. in the ongoing everyday parts of the business. I say three to four because I only met three and I don't know if the fourth is involved. Okay. But, there are there's a bunch of companies like this where they were started by you know a handful of people who collectively shared all of the responsibilities and now they're trying to figure out how to systematize and delegate the things that founders shouldn't be doing. But which by the way is talk- awesome for the first like six months of business, but when you start having <laughs> okay. success, it sucks. Total ass. <laughs> which part? Which part does? Because there's uh, like having four partners that you're basically all shouldering the risk and therefore all equity partners and therefore only paying on performance is dope to get a lot of shit done in the beginning. Because it's like, well, if we, we sink, we sink. If we swim, we swim. If we make money, we get paid yep. equally, et cetera. But when you start actually making money and then it's like, well, Jimmy's doing this over here and Erica is over here not pulling her away because she's a slack ass. And then you got mm. Derek over here who's working 60 hours a week. You know, it's like then you have like the greedy. That's when turmoil starts to come in of like, we've all got 25% and... Whatever. That's a total caveat to your question. I'm just throwing that out there as like, if you guys are thinking about getting in business together and there's like four partners, like I've not seen that work super well. Yeah. I, I feel like most companies that I run into that were started by a handful of people, yeah. multiple have either left already or been bought out or sold their shares or whatever. I'll put it this way. Um, if, if you are a typical agency, say you're operating at 15% margin and you do $5 million in revenue, 15% margin on 5 million in revenue is what, 750 grand? Yeah, you're better at math. So sure. So 750 grand split four ways. Like you built a $5 million company to get paid what you'd get paid at a job, but with way more stress. Yeah. You know? Yep. So it's tough, but what? So do you take, like, do you take the the lesser involved of the parties and then figure out which responsibilities they are shouldering that actually carry some weight, uh, like some director level weight. And then you go find some really capable FTEs to fill yeah, that. Like, couple salaried. Ways. Okay. What I found with when there's a lot of partners is typically someone or some ones get bought out. Yeah. Which sucks for you as well, but it's good for you in the long run. If you have a, if you have a long-term vision, um, I think honestly, if you're going to a partnership and you have partners, um, I've not historically done this, um, mostly because I'm I am the predominant majority captain of the ship at all times. Um, but I've seen if there's a book and a methodology, especially for like software companies and stuff called slicing pie model methodology. 
And um, oh, this is I, good. Yeah, I think that this is an extremely fair way of identifying what your slice of the slices of the pie is worth. So historically, we think of things like there's a pie, there's eight slices. How many of those slices do I get? Yep. And that's how we determine equity. And it's like, oh, I want four and you get four. So we get 50 percent each. In the slicing pie model, it's not about there's eight slices. It's the pie gets bigger, but the slices also grow. As value is injected into the company, slices are then spit out. And so I might have 3,200 slices. You might have earned 1,700 slices and some other person might have earned 2,200 slices. That's now your percentage and that changes on a quarterly or annual basis. And so therefore... It's a it's a an ever evolving equity. Now the good thing is is as the pie grows, y- you don't lose money or value. Just the the pie gets more expensive and valuable. So therefore, you have you still have less slices, but it's still worth as much or more. So and slices are 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 representations uh, of value based, based on like. Buckets that you own or value you create. How how value. do you? Yeah. So okay. it's 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 based on contribution and value. So like typically, but value is subjective, right? So it has to be about contribution, and there has to be rules when you go into it. So how the slicing pie model works is, let's just say, let's use a really easy example. I want to build an app. I've got an idea for the app I want to build. It's going to be this incredible app that does X, Y, and Z, and whatever. I've got it mapped out of exactly what I want. Do what? So it finds hot dog stands near you. That's right. (laughs) So I go to you and you're a developer. And I'm like, hey, here's the app I want to build. Here's the idea. Here's the boom. Here's our customers. Here's how we're going to go to market. You're like, cool. I'll build it. That's my equity contribution. We'll go 50-50 today. Cool. Well, in this model, a time will come where that app makes money. Um, and then we have to determine is your 50% still worth it or is my 50% still worth it? And I'm going to go to you and be like, dude, it was my idea. I scripted it out, whatever my, my, I deserve more. Go, oh, well, yeah, it was your idea, but your idea couldn't come to the market unless I built it. So uh, I deserve more. Right. And mm-hmm. so then it's, just, it's, it's subjective. So yeah. What's well, who mediates? Does? Do what? Who mediates that? Is it a set of rules that well, you that, created? Well, that situation is typical situation. That's what people get in every day. Slicing yeah. pie is different. So it's a set of rules. And there's multiples on value. So uh, typically when you're doing a startup, money is more valuable than time. You typically have more time than you have money. Right? And so therefore, money is valued at a particular multiple. Right? Yep. And so I get X amount of slices for every X amount of dollars I put in, right? Well, you're c- contributing time, which is less valuable than money because you have more time than money. It's simple, simple economics. So the time that you put in is, is given a certain multiple on your time, and that gives you a certain amount of slices. So how do you determine that? Well, I look at what is my typical wage in the market that I can make with my skill set. And then I do a times two multiple. Well, if someone injected sure. money for the same amount, there's like a times four multiple because money's twice as valuable as time. So that's a way that you have slices. I'm now given four slices. You're given two in this particular. Right? Well, then it's like, okay, well, then who had the idea? Well, you treat that like you would treat a royalty deal. And so it's like, okay, so for every sale we make, we treat it like a royalty deal. I want essentially 5% of every dollar that comes in attributed to my contribution. So therefore, my slice is now increased by royalty. And then if you are the one selling, well, you're not taking commissions because you just own the business. So you're going to say, what was my foregone commissions worth? And then that is now multiplied by the multiple that we see as foregone income, right? So there's all these different equations. It does get very complex. It's very hard to handle, but it's the ultimate fairness leveler because at the beginning before you do everything you agree upon what things are worth yep. and then you operate moving forward knowing those equations and you just start plugging in the equations so let me like play out that hypothetical a little bit so if I injected $500,000 that won me two shares or whatever right well the the standard math would say if the company grows by 3x 
mm-hmm. then my shares are now worth $1.5 million. Mm-hmm. The pie method, like it's not simple like that. Like I still own my same percentage of shares, but the pie could grow and my valuation could only grow by 75% versus yeah, so like, heck. So it would be like, okay, I'm given... 100 slices for my contribution and this guy yep. was given 50. Well, today mm-hmm. I own 66% and he owns 33. Yeah. Right? Because I injected capital when it was the most necessary. Well, yep. if he's out there grinding and selling and injecting time, if he's foregoing salary, I'm not injecting any more capital or time. And so, and it's his idea. So every time it sells, his slices grow. So I still have 100 slices, but now he might have 70 or 80. Right. And so now it's it's like a 60 40 split. And eventually yeah. he can keep contributing. Right. Because it's now it's it, his efforts are creating money. Whoops. I just hit my microphone. You're good. No, you're good. Um, so now he's not injecting capital, but he's he's injecting um, money through sales and foregone commissions that he could take home in a sales role anywhere else. And so and then it becomes it, it just becomes a math game. So it's like, okay, I've got 100 slices of pie. You've got 70. We've got 170. Well, I know my equity is whatever 170, whatever 100 slices is of 170, yep. right? And yours is whatever 80 slices is or 70 slices is of 170. But if you earn another 70 slices, so now you have 140 slices, you actually yes. have more equity because of the time. So but I think where the this value works, is bigger. Right. So that's why the guy who has who has less slices now than you do. Yep. It's worth more, right? It's it's the whole slice of a watermelon versus a whole grape. It's like, yeah, I have less equity, but it's more value. It's no different than because your capital. Go ahead. Right? Yeah. yeah so you yeah. got round one, they come in and and you know, let's just say they inject a million dollars and it gets them ten percent. So the ten million dollar valuation. Well, then someone else comes in and uh, they inject twenty million dollars for twenty uh, percent or something like that. Right. So that's a what is that a four hundred? million yeah. dollar valuation. Yep. Right. And so as you dilute, you could dilute other people, but it's still v- extremely valuable in the grand yeah. scheme of what this company is now worth. I, I feel like this methodology, like it probably works best for the scenario we just laid out with like founders, partners, uh, active investors who aren't just like an outside passive investor. Yeah. I feel like, Passive investors don't want to see this this pie scenario played out, right? Like they want to invest their 10% or to invest their money, earn their 10%, and then their 10% grows with the company because that's Well, they the, do and they don't. Like, yeah, they're getting diluted, but they're getting diluted yep. at a higher value, right? So it's, so yes, you're right. Um, You know, it's a lot easier to say, well, I want 15% forever because I bought it at 15%, right? That makes a ton of right. sense. Um. But if if the other person is not incentivized, the non capital injecting person is not incentivized, then then the then the pie isn't going to be more valuable because they're not incentivized, and so therefore it doesn't yeah. matter if you have more percentages because your pie is not worth much. So I'd rather you be incentivized and grow your slices, and my equity can shrink. That's fine, but now my equity is worth instead of my equity being worth five hundred grand, my equity is worth eight hundred grand, even though I have less less percentage. What's the name of the book? Slicing pie. Slicing pie methodology. It's really good. So. You know, like it's really good when you're starting a company to set those parameters at the front. Yeah. Very few people ever really do it. Um, I think they do. I think they will come in and evaluate what everyone's contributions worth. And they have, you know, who thought of the idea and who's done the sales and who's done the marketing, cool. and who's done the finance, whatever. And so they've they got like a consultancy that comes in. I think so. I think there's like some okay. slicing pie people that'll come in and, and do that. And then it's basically, okay, great. Now someone has to just man the slicing pie contributions and every quarter we revisit it and therefore we make you know the operating agreement changes based off of that Maybe once a year once a quarter whatever you decide well this conversation was way more fun than what i was going to ask you about but i still need to ask you my initial question which is sure in the scenario where you have three four five founders co-founders um do you like seeing that one of them stick around in a sales leadership or bd role or would you like to see all founders if there's a bunch of them removed from those kind of day-to-day leadership positions depends on the goal i think if their goal is to exit yes get them out get everybody out 
Anybody who's an equity holder who will have, uh, because you're going to get a lower multiple when it's no different than like one single founder still being involved in delivery. Well, I know that if I buy you, I can't do delivery unless you're involved. And so therefore I, you're not worth it. It's not a turnkey mm-hmm. business I'm buying. And so if there are four partners and one is still heavily involved, let's say they have 25%. Well, that person, 25% is less, it, it's, it's more valuable to the company, less valuable to the buyer. Yeah. And the overall so, sale. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause I don't want you to be involved cause you're exiting and you have an earn out. And so, you know, it's going to, it's going to lessen the value of your company. You know, it's really, it's the difference between seller discretionary earnings and EBITDA based businesses. So most of us use the terminology EBITDA because it's easy. We think of net profit. Um, realistically, most of us who are under, call it five, 10 million, um, we typically operate our business somewhat like a seller discretionary earning business. Now, what that means is, is SDE is, is basically the sellers, right? The, the owners discretionary earnings is built into the profit margin because they're involved in every aspect of the company. They don't own the asset, right? The asset, if if you just owned an asset and it produced its financials, that would be EBITDA, right? Earnings before interest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? If you are involved in aspects of the business, you are on payroll, therefore. And therefore, seller's discretionary earnings is now a part of your net profit, right? And so I have to remove myself from every facet of the business and it needs to become an asset for me. And therefore, it needs to be an EBITDA valuated business instead of a seller discretionary earnings based business. Yeah, goes back to goals. That, that's that's great. Goals. So because, little, yeah, you're right. Like, it, no, I think if it's not, um, if the exit's not at the forefront of your mind, it does make sense, right? Like if, if your founders, especially season, if one is... Yeah gifted in this area of biz dev or sales or leadership or whatever like i think it makes sense to have that heartbeat of your business in a leadership role running the growth centric dollars in component of your agency yes and i think that you can build infrastructure around that person and remove them to a pretty high degree sure right like what we do with sales driven so i actually put on a video on youtube um Technically, I put it out today as recording this, but not today when this goes live. So this is a couple of weeks old video for you guys who are listening. Okay. But it's basically, I think it's five, um, five sales team models as you evolve as an agency. And so I talk about, it's a really good video. It's badass. Um, and I do like a whiteboard kind of breakdown, but I'm talking about like the evolution of a sales operation is at first it's founder based seller, right? You're a founder or a partner. And you are the direct communication with the client. You generate the lead through your network, through referral, through outbound, whatever it is. But you are the one point of contact. You're the only, you generate the lead. You work the lead. You close the lead. That's founder based seller. The mm-hmm. next layer down is enabled founder based seller. So that is taking the same thing, the founder who's selling, but you're enabling them with an assistant, right? So in our case, it was Nick, right? So the assistant job is to help them remove non-revenue generating activities off their plate so they can focus more on revenue generation. Yeah. The the next layer, potentially, is a uh, sales development rep enabled founder-based seller. So that's okay. very similar to the assistant or the enabled-based, but instead of having you and your assistant generating leads, you have sales development reps who generate leads for you. And you can still have an assistant in this case, I would highly suggest it, where you have lead gen coming in from el- elsewhere. And you have yourself as the founder-based seller closing with the help of an assistant to take some of the non-revenue generating activities off your plate. We've gone through all these stages, right? And then the next layer is really a decision you have to make. Either we're going to have a team where it's sales development reps and closers, which is what Sales Driven Agency currently has. Uh, I would highly suggest that if you have a higher margin agency, 25% or more where you have teams of SDRs who do lead gen and you have closers who do the closing and you can have assistants to enable the closers. But the founder is now removed from the sales process. And then step five is um, full stack salesperson, right? Where where salespeople um, open deals themselves, work deals themselves, close deals themselves. It's a lot like founder-based selling, but it's now a full stack salesperson who can devote 40 hours a week to this job entirely. 
And then yep. the next iteration of that is giving an assistant to that full stack salesperson and or salespeople. Whew. Woo. <laughs> Uh, that's cool. I'm going to check the video. I didn't know you made one. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, are you walking iPad, around your screen. farm or are you? I was in here in the studio. Okay. I actually made two videos. I just scheduled them. I'm trying to do like a training video every Monday, have an interview based podcast episode every Wednesday and have our sales in the rocks every Friday. Solid content's coming out left and right. It is. Just Best to damn agency podcast. Death, be the number one resource for digital agencies to grow. That's the goal. At least I'll succeed. So, I know you you will. We are well on our way. Um, I had a personal situation today that I. It's either the last thing we're going to talk about or the second to last thing we're going to talk about. So. I kind of mentioned it as before we jumped on, but basically I totally fucked up. Mm. I in my head, like when I did my my startup today, I looked at my calendar and I captured the couple like follow up or actual meetings I have with prospects or clients. And in my head, this meeting was at two o'clock. Yeah. And so I had a bunch of tasks I had to do for like three hours. I was running around town, getting stuff done. One o'clock rolls around and I realize at like one ten that I just totally dropped the ball because the meeting was at one, not two. Yes. Ghosted this prospect, didn't show up, felt like garbage. It's the first time I think I've ever done this in the last two years. Mm-hmm. Um, my question is, have you done this? And then two... If so, how have you, like, have you salvaged the conversation or is it just lost at that point? (laughs) Uh, Yes, I've done it. Uh, Probably multiple times. You know, I think my, and and the reason I didn't get mad, like, it's just whatever. Yeah, I pay for the leads and if we lose them, it sucks. But at the same time, it's like, as I've always said, like, mistakes are okay. It's, it's repeated mistakes. And, you know, I don't have to say anything for JJ to know. I'm never going to do that again. Right. Like yep. he knows he feels bad about it. It's like, why would I? There's nothing wrong with that. Right. It's okay. It's a sales opportunity and we can still salvage it. Right. So, yes, I've done it. I've probably done it 10 times in my life. I'm sure. Um, whether it be on accident or, or I've had plenty of times where I've probably had a few times where it's just like I missed it and that's rare. I have plenty of times where calls go long and I screw up a conversation. Um, so typically it's just I mean it's a profuse you know I just apologize profusely it's like listen yeah I committed the cardinal sin I looked at my calendar this morning for some reason it registered two o'clock I was running around town I was excited about our call I was looking forward to it I was going to get home at 1 30 and prepare for it and give myself some time to prepare and then next thing you know I'm sitting in traffic and I get a notification that our call started and I'm already too late and so uh one, I hope you could forgive me for wasting your time today. Uh, two, I've done some podcasts actually where I've had to miss a, or reschedule a podcast. Two, what's your address? I'd love to send you my favorite bottle of bourbon as an apology. Oh, that's um, good. And three, if you can muster up uh, or you, if you can stomach setting another call with me, I promise this won't happen again. I'd love to to reschedule our time because I did value our time. So the bottle of bourbon is actually really good. Be- well, and and what I thought I would do... I did a lot of the things you said, maybe not as eloquently as you just laid it out, but it was sort of a, hey, here's what happened. Totally an anomaly. This is not how we go about handling business. I understand it was unprofessional. I apologize, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Told them why. And then I think I said, I would totally understand if you didn't want to reschedule this call. But in the event that you give me a second chance to have this conversation, uh, I'll make it worth your while. And so my thought was, if we do jump in, I will just eat my commission on the roadmap and discount it like you know 500 bucks or whatever it is um and the then roadmap? you know it's still yeah yeah i'll do that i would just say like hey if he does show up for the call like have have a nice bottle of bourbon already on the side and just sure. say hey i'm gonna send you this i don't care if you don't want it give it re-gift it if you need to um i value your time as much as our last time maybe didn't express that, but um, I value my time as well. And I, I would hate it if someone did this to me. And so sure. as a, an apology and as a thank you for jumping back on, I've already bought it. So I'm going to send it. You just need to tell me your address. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's good. And that's if good. you don't, then I'm going to give it to a homeless guy who's a drunk and he doesn't need this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, uh, I gave money to a homeless guy today. It never goes well, dude. 
I know. I, I'm a huge fan of like sitting down, talking to them, asking totally. them about their get life. Them food. Like, I'll get you food all day long. I'll get you clothes, but I'm not going to give you my money. Dude, here's the thing. I opened up my wallet and I was like, I know I've got a $5 bill in here. That's what I want to give them right now. Like, it's enough to get a sandwich right next door. I don't have time, but I want to support this guy. I opened it up. It was, it was like all I had was a 20. Oh, no. I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> so I just asked the guy. To, <laughs> I wasn't gonna ask the guy for change. Um I did we had a long conversation. I was like, hey man, like what do you need? Like, what are you gonna buy with that 20 bucks? I just wanted to ask him. I don't mean I don't need to know, but uh who knows what he bought with it. He was nice. His name was Enoch. Enoch, nice. Kind of like the Bible. Yeah. Just disappeared. Yeah, we it was interesting, but uh he said he was gonna buy some food and some see heroin. if he gets some more money. <laughs> what? Some food huh? and a little side of heroin. <laughs> yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll see. I guess we won't see. I'll never know. Um, man, that's good. I, we, we'll wrap this up because we were, we're running kind of, I think we're coming up on the hour. I've I've got something pressing that I am experiencing presently that I want to talk about on the podcast. But I think Let's we'll it. save it till next week. I think, it, I think it'd be super helpful to everybody, but I All think right. it's a better like opener banter conversation than like give a, a teaser? tacking on to the end. Yeah, I think that COVID sucked ass. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us, whether we had massive changes where we moved towns and jobs and life experiences like I did, um, or we just experienced quarantine and lockdown and all the uncertainty that accompanied the last year and a half, like all of us have been through hell and back, right? In some way, shape or form, it's been hard for our families. It's been hard for us personally. And I think what I just realized is I have not grieved that season in any way, mm. shape, or form. And it is significantly holding me back from the things that I want to achieve. So we'll talk a little bit more about that next nice. week. But um, I like it. It's worth talking about on the show because I think everybody's in that place. So dope. Like um, yeah, man. No, I, I appreciate all of the insight. I think there's a lot of good takeaways from this. I hope people go and actually check out the slices of pie book. I think that'd be really cool. I actually, if you send me shit, I will I'll show it on the show. We have good clients and friends who send me stuff all the time uh brian cross just sent me his book fuck your formula uh yeah. brian from elasticity agency i'm really fired up to dig into that uh but if you send me swag i'll i'll wear I, I'm, I'm actually wearing another client's oh, there you stuff go. <laughs> hat. i'm wearing jason's spotlight social. spotlight social so shout out to those guys love y'all love you guys you listen to the show swag from uh bad rhino i'm pretty pumped marty's sending us oh, some the bad rhino swag is going to be good i'll wear that stuff. on the show and then we're we're putting together something pretty killer for mm -hmm. the mastermind members to wear in Tahoe. so Tahoe. speaking of mastermind, be we, don't, we don't really pitch anymore because uh we're kind of full but kind of full you know we're we're getting there tahoe we might have to have some interesting living situations we'll figure it out but yeah if you're a seven or eight figure agency CEO and you believe in multiplication, meaning you want to multiply your business, sure, your revenue, of course, your influence, yes, but you want to multiply who you are as a leader, as a man, as a husband, as a father. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and flat out say it. This is a men's only agency owner group. So ladies, I'm sorry. I'm very sexist. Uh, you should cancel me for that reason. I'm not sexist at all. I just have a passion for developing men as leaders. And this is my only passion avenue. And you're not going to fuck with my passion. So, uh, ladies, I love you. But I'm here for the men. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have signed off five minutes ago. Uh, but here we are. We'll be here every Friday. You already know. Sales in the Rocks yep. podcast. Joey, as always, it's an honor to jump into this conversation with you. Uh, Mastermind members, if you're listening. See you in Tahoe in six weeks. So, uh, and you better be a dude because it's a dudes only group. <laughs> Peace, bitches.